Peter Jones, who's going to talk to us about uh, digital forensics and uh, uh, challenges of preparing and responding uh, in that context. So, Peter, over to you. Do you need uh, access to the screen, Pete? He's already there. Look at that. Yeah, there he goes. He's the black Mr. Collard. I knew you wouldn't disappoint, Pete. <laughs> That's all right. Hey, look. One of, the, one of the biggest things that I thought we could, we could talk about this morning is the fact that maybe nobody gets it. Uh, and I thought, well, let's have a bit of fun this morning. Um, so I'll put something together. So, yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, you're a resident digital forensic talking person in the group. So uh, it's something I'm incredibly passionate about. I've been involved in forensics and incident response since 2009. Um, very much don't get to do a lot of the hands-on stuff these days, uh, which is the nature of the beast in management and all that. But still very much involved with the framework and from a practitioner side of things. And actually getting stuff in place to make things life easier for people. One thing I do see a lot of is where it goes wrong. And it actually when it goes wrong, they usually blame the practitioner. And as practitioners, we blame the business. Uh, and, and we blame the client. And I thought it would be nice actually to have a talk about it. So, yeah, a, a little bit tongue in cheek. You know, is it is it a dark art? Is it though? You know, I do love a good old meme. Um, so, is it? Is it? Well, the reason that we call it a bit of a dark art is because once people start seeing what we do, people get all very glassy eyed, rabbit in headlights, see lots of numbers, lots of screens. We look like a big set of nerds in a dark room. And they tend to go, well, oh, thanks for coming, and they'll, they'll disappear. And then we also have on the flip side, the men in black style moment where we've been called in and we've all turned up with all our kit, our pelly cases, our bag probably got close to 50 to 100 hard drives in. And again, people run away like we're wearing hazmat suits, um, which is highly entertaining. On the flip side, though, I have walked into a number of businesses uh, with said petty cases and suits, and it's been the wrong business because they've just looked at me and gone, Christ, he looks like he means business. Come on in. That happened at Barclay Card. They just let me in. The company I wanted to be at was a floor above. So, here, yeah, fun, fun little story. Uh, but what is digital forensics? Okay, we, we are the unloved child of the forensic science industry. Okay, why are we the unloved child? It's because we have that word forensics in our title. Well, really, they're like, ooh, computers, ooh, keep away. Keep away, computers, where a traditional forensics, you know, blood, <coughs> footprints, fingerprints. And even we went, from a UCAS perspective, when I was doing audits, you always saw that the other ones are all very pally together, the traditional forensics. Computers, they're over there. They're in that dark room with a big lock on it that we're not allowed into because they look at stuff. They see stuff. Well, actually, the reality is we do. Um, so the, you know, from a concept point of view, the recovery investigation of material found on digital devices. And yeah, you automatically will assume computers. But I will tell you now, I've investigated fridge freezers, washing machines, microwaves, smart kitchens, I've had so much fun in cars when I ripped out people's dashboards. All that is digital forensics. The reality is we, every step you take, that, <laughs> that term digital footprint is actually really, really true. Everybody on this screen is, is fantastic for me because every second you're on this call, you're leaving a footprint. So if one of you committed a crime later on today, the investigator will go, well, I can go as far back and say, oh, they've on this Zoom call. They've got an alibi. Or well, actually, the ones who don't have the cameras on, they are the ones committing murder right now. Potentially. Obviously, that's hearsay. People who've not got the cameras on. All the cameras suddenly get turned on. Love that. Thank you very much. Um, this is a bit more reality. All right. I've, ha I've had desks like this. You know, sat there. I've got an exhibit in one hand. I've got a mouse in the other hand. I've got a piece of equipment in the middle doing an investigation. I've got pictures on the screen. And then I've got hexadecimal. I've got different images, I've got uh, different partitions, and then I've got more hex going off over there. You know, that could be a picture, that could be an executable file, that could be an executable file inside a picture, and it goes on and on and on. So depending on the perspective we're looking at, you know, am I looking for indecent imagery? 
Am I looking for that email? Am I looking for that malware that's plonked on your machine that's come through a family photo of your friend's three dogs? Unfortunately, taking away all the sexiness, that's also forensics. Progress bars, lots and lots and lots of progress bars. Taking into consideration how fast machines have got, computers have got. Computers in forensics are very much like police cars. The hackers, the attackers, the ones committing the crimes are getting faster and faster machines. So we have to get faster and faster machines, but then we get faster, more and more data, which means our machines are churning and churning and churning. Forensic labs are probably one of some of the hottest rooms you've ever been in your life because each forensic examiner may have two, three computers each, all churning through terabytes and terabytes of data just to find one silver bullet of image. So digital forensics, the reason we call it forensic is because it's got a science to it. We have a pattern of how we get to the answer. And it, it does feel like you're running through treacle sometimes. It's quite difficult to get to where you'll be. And I wanted to use this talk a little bit to give you a bit of perspective of, of the, the lack of sexiness in forensics, because there is a, a distinct lack of sexiness in the industry. We have these five principles, okay, on, on a very high level. We've got to identify what we want. We need to preserve what we want. And then hopefully by the time we've got to that point, we're doing some analysis. And this is based on the thing we've got in the first place is what we want. And the reason I keep on saying this, you go into a house of a um, prolific paedophile, they will have lots of computers. And from a forensic perspective, when I was in the police, you've got to depend on those bobbies actually confiscating the right machines. And they'll have to take the most obvious machine in the house, maybe the one in the bedroom, maybe the laptop that's shoved in the other uh, side of the sofa. But actually, the server that's got all their images might be in the um, crack in the wall, which again, I've witnessed. We've had to smash through a wall to take the server out, which was in between the joists. That, that, uh, the, the analytical process does take a long time. That's the reality. You start putting that in a commercial environment where they've got hundreds and hundreds of servers, not the one server in someone's household, then put the next step on that, that actually they've got multiple branches around the country. Then put another step in there again, that they've got multiple countries with officers. If we don't get the identification right and the preservation right, the analysis bit is pointless. And give you some give you a story. So the previous organization I worked for, we had a um, Asian retailer who owned some of the biggest franchises you'd you recognize on your high street. And through the identification process, the breach happened in uh, Pakistan. But actually, the infection and the servers out in question were, uh, if I remember rightly, um, closer towards Australia. So we were in a completely wrong part of the world at this point. Documentation is really, really important to us. I still get told to this day when I write notes, I write notes like a forensic analyst. Time, date, did a thing. Time, date, did a thing. Time, date, did a thing. Why? So I can go back. Why? So somebody can check what I do. Because it was one of the worst things to do is when you present evidence to somebody and it got, gets thrown out, particularly from a court level. Well, actually, you do that as well. So when you present it in a commercial environment, you can say, well, this is how I got to this point. And then that's where you get down to the presentation. Look, this is, this is the, the silver bullet. This is the smoking gun. This is the thing that I wanted to find and investigate in the first place. We have basic fourth principles. So this is the ACPO, the old um, Association of Chief Principles, uh, pr police officers, sorry. Um, they're not called this anymore, but we still refer to it as the ACPO principles. And long, the long and short of it is you need to be trained in what you do. You don't wing it. If you think you're winging it, you should stop. You've got the audit trail. And actually, the person in charge, what we would call the OIC, officer in charge, still works in a commercial environment, 
But when you come to an investigation, an investigation that could go straight up to a criminal matter, it's really important the person at the top stays at the top and you don't make decisions on behalf of somebody else because it could fall like a stack of cards. And that happens. So I borrowed this slide. I thought it was quite good, actually. It gives you a bit of a, a visual representation of the sort of things that we can investigate. It's a, it's a bit of a can of worms when we come to forensics. I can tell you now, I have seen some home videos in my time. I can, see, I can tell you I've seen some emails that are condemning, which have nothing to do with the forensic case I've been looking at. And this comes down to that digital footprint. Once you start using your device, or any sort of device, and your car, your, your Amazon Alexa, your TV, you're giving it permission to store data. And honestly, that's just something Jeff feels very passionate about. And all that's on there. I don't get to pick and choose what I get to look at because that data's gone. This, this device has gone. I've got it all. Here you go on a silver plate. Moving it on, which, how it fits into the wider scheme of things. We've got the instant response life cycle. And this is actually something from a business perspective you're going to be more akin to than the forensic process I just mentioned. Because you're never, ever, ever going to get involved in that part of the process. You're going, well, okay, if I've got ISO, Cyber Essentials, all the other standards, I'm going to have to have some sort of way to know how I'm going to deal with it when it hits the fan. Well, this is the life cycle. We've got, again, preparation. That's like our identification process. Detect, analyze. Yeah, yeah very similar. But then this response is all about contain, eradicate, recover, get the business back up and running. We need to make money, which is absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. I don't have a problem with that. The problem I've got with is actually forensics covers all that. And I'm all about preservation. So wait a minute. Calm down a second. I know you need to make money. Absolutely completely get you need to make money. But if I can't do my job properly, we all could be screwed. It all could fall down again. And I've told you already, we're not wizards. We don't know, I don't know your business. And you're screaming at my ear going, I need, I need to, why, why is this virus coming to my network? Why, why have I got red screens on everywhere? Why is the CEO telling me that he can't do that vital meeting he's on? Poor, I can't read minds. I don't come in and touch your computer and know everything about your network. And that's pretty much 99% of jobs you go into. Why can't, why can't you do your thing? Whoa, I can't do my thing because I don't know your topology. I don't know your, how you do account provisions. I don't know about your web application. I need your help. You, you need to give me a, a fighting chance. And the problem with standards, it says, it'll be on there for a little bit, you know, third party involvement, special interest groups. Yeah, we're gonna call forensic people in. And then you're already back to thinking about recovery, getting the business up and working again. Just, just take, take a breath, take a breath. So let's quickly revisit those stages. Identification, where's your asset register? Just tell me where your assets are. What, 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 what we got, what we got to play with. You've got 500 registered devices, right, great. We know where these devices are, great. So we've possibly got a, a rogue device, a sinkhole device, right, possibly, okay, maybe. We've got rogue USB, right, fine, okay, okay. You can start see my way of thinking, you're helping me. Preservation, you've put something in your instant response program. You understand, you've got things in there to go, we can contain. But wait a minute, we've gone back to the instant response life cycle. We're containing. So I've got to go back a step. That actually gives me an opportunity to do my, my analysis. Go back forward again. You can start putting steps in from the detection and analysis point of view, because I've gone. Do you know what? I know how we got in. I know how we got in. You can start getting the business back up and working again, because I've done my preservation now, so I'm going to take that to one side with my 100 discs I brought in on petty cases, and I'm going to continue doing my analysis. So actually, the digital forensics investigation continues going. It continues going while you're getting your business back into full life cycle. 
don't know if I watched his new Amsterdam, personally quite fun. Um, and the whole idea of, you know, how can I help? You are there to help from a commercial point of view. You can't just drop the bomb on forensic guys. Because actually, every bit of information you give me that I'm writing down in my audit log, in my forensic notes, as part of my audit trail, oh, wait a minute, you know, uh, Paul Hancock told me this thing. And then Akeem told me this thing. And then Laura told me this thing. Oh, wait a minute. Jeff, didn't you mention something over here? And that helps the investigational process. So a couple of things to remember. Yeah, digital forensics is the most sexy thing on the planet. Absolutely. You know, Doug, we sit in rooms day and night, really dark rooms sometimes, lots of coffee, pizza, kicking machines, swearing at machines, which has got to 99% and it's failed. But how you help us is having an up-to-date asset register. Know where your kit is. Know where your people are. Know where your software is. Ensure your response procedures include preservation. Don't just go, yeah, we're going to engage in forensic department over there. We've got them on the list. We've never actually spoke to them ever, but they're there. We'll probably ring them. We might ring Pete, you know, the cyber badger. You might know somebody, probably, maybe. I don't know. Who cares? It never happens to us. Remember, investigations can and will usually take longer than you getting covered again. Screaming in our ears, telling us you need to know the answers to the infection. He's not going to get it any quicker. Communication is very key. People need to know what's going on. You also need to know interested parties, make sure everybody's aware. Uh, again, when I tell you when the, the, we're there in our black suits, turning up at investigation scenes, and everybody in the organization is looking through that inevitable glass windowed office, going, what are those guys up to with our 10 laptops and there's only three of us in the room? It gathers attention. And you've got to think about how you move that attention away from us. Transparency is key because once the box is open, it will fly open. Because particularly in the business, we will see stuff. And also more importantly, we have an obligation to report stuff. And just as I finish, a little quick case study for you. And this was one of my, an interesting job I did. It was a sexual harassment case um, against the director. And it was a uh, digital marketing organization, which all well, must have lots of money. They had about 13 Apple Macs. Everybody had an Apple Mac. But it was free will. Free will, I can log in, I can just use it. They had no control over their assets. So when I went in uh, as the lead, I went, right, okay, which devices or which device does he use? Well, he usually uses that one over there, but I think he's used that one a bit. I think he's used that one over there a bit. He's used that one over a bit. Guess what happened? I confiscated the room. I stopped them working. I had to stop them working. It was a criminal case. I had to preserve every single Apple Mac in that room. Kind of felt like this. I had to say, you are going to have to leave the room. You've got to leave your office because I've got to preserve the scene. And that obviously had a massive impact on the wider organization. Thank you very much for listening to me, Witter.